All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is, I think, our only call for this month for the community call, because in two weeks we'll have uh, Eat Denver, and we'll be uh, missing that one. But um, it's a big one today. We're discussing creds. So I wanted to do our usual run a show here. Welcome, everybody. And then we're going to hand it off to Shane for a little bit, and then Ben for a little bit to talk about creds and some product updates. Next week's a really busy week, which I'm really excited about. Um, I'm excited, Shane, to give us an update on everything that's going on with the protocol. So first and foremost, I want to do my, my usual shout outs and say uh, Shane joined the team and did his first builders call, which I thought was awesome. Changed the format a little bit, but basically kind of dialed in on like what's important to the community and what are the things that we should be focusing on, um, especially around like the Cosmos ecosystem and how the SDK enables a lot of integrations that maybe we weren't thinking about before. So. As people are looking for more work and more ways to support Shannon, Shane, I just want to say thank you for um, inspiring some ideas. And here's a little golf clap. I really appreciate that. Um, also, open floor if anybody else has any other shout outs for the last week. Again, just things that people are doing that may not be seen front and center, um, but just a way to say thank you. Wanted to uh, mention all the folks that have been involved with uh, making uh, RC zero eleven one pushed through. Uh, we've got all the validators, um, uh, at least uh, over eighty percent of the validators updated. Uh, there's been a lot of testing on the uh, protocol from the protocol team and from uh, the coder team uh, specifically. And so, just shout out to all of them who've put a lot of work into making this upgrade possible. Heck yeah, man. Yeah, thank you everybody. I realize there's a ton of work that we don't see because um, you're all hard doing the work. So thanks for that shout out, Shane. This one from my side, Zach, um, a couple actually. One is a um, uh, big thanks to Ramiro. Um, the uh, creds voting um, is something that we want to make as safe and secure as possible. And the important part of that is is sort of modeling a whole heap of scenarios. So um, uh, Ramiro from Pocket Scans helped us with that, which is um, which is greatly appreciated. And then the other one is um, we're uh, planning on doing um, a retroactive um, uh, funding round um, for our Pocket community. Um, core part of that is is um, working with some of our partners like Gitcoin to um, uh, get the tech and the process ready. Um, there is a group that's working on that. Um, it's at a call time that's really inconvenient to me. So my dad from Microflow is being sort of jumping in and representing Pocket on that, which has been um, a huge help and I think it's going to make a massive difference when we, uh, when we do our funding round. So thanks to my dad for that. Thank you, Mayor Dad. And thanks, Ben. Um, Meredad, I'm seeing your name come up all over the place here. So really excited to have you in the ecosystem. We really appreciate all that you're contributing. I think I cut you off, Romero. Do you wanna do you wanna jump in? Oh, I just joined, so I know what you're talking about, but yeah, Merad, it's a, it's a great guy in the community. So <laughs> that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Shout out. Awesome. Cool. I'll give uh, I'll give another beat or two for any other shout outs. Okay, moving on. Um, we have some announcements this week. So there are no DAO proposals, but I think the biggest one, which is what we're here to discuss, is the pre-proposal -pro -pre on uh, creds and governance. Uh, there's been a big discussion in the forum, and I'm going to drop that right here in the chat. It's been a big discussion on the forum with a lot of issues brought up and um, had a sneak peek on some of the slides here. And I think Ben's going to address many of them. But uh, the big thing here is to weigh in. Obviously, this is your DAO. So uh, we want people to test as much as we can and to bring up as many questions to make sure that we've thought through everything we need to. Um, so yeah, just a big shout out to everybody that this is hugely important. So we want to do this right. And we need your input to do that. Um, the RC 011.1 upgrade, which Shane is going to talk about, uh, it's the final Morse update before Shannon, so it's a big deal, and I think that's going out on Monday. Um, Shane will talk a little bit more. And then uh, there are now bounties open in Discord. So 
Uh, instead of reopening D work, we wanted to try to be lightweight about it. There's some descriptions, some ways to um, apply. You can also read more about the contributions that you can do in our docs. So we've updated that. I'll drop in as well. And, and just a reminder that the bounties are, uh, we'll just call them a work in progress. We tried to do a lightweight way. Um, if you're finding any bugs or kinks with those, just call them out and we can fix that process. Um, the goal is to give people opportunities to contribute to the ecosystem and uh, get paid to do that pretty easily. And so if they're not doing that, then we need to readjust. So feedback's welcome there. And you can find those in Discord. Um, if for some reason you don't have access to that channel, definitely DM me. Uh, I'll just need to check some settings here. And the last one is uh, for this month, for anybody who's getting a grant from, um, from the DAO, we're going to try a new process using a tool called Karma Gap to track that impact. Like Ben had mentioned, we are going to do a retro PGF round. So uh, documenting this impact is really important for us and really important for you. So I think it's going to do a couple of things for the community, which is give us some more clear guidelines around uh, what kind of impact is important and how we're measuring that impact, as opposed to this kind of nebulous, like I opened a socket, is it doing anything important right now? And so I really want to make that clear to the community and the people. Um, and then it also gives you all a way of tracking your history. And then when it comes time for a retro PGF round, it's going to make it a lot easier for other people to say, oh, this was really helpful and um, it, it's deserving of a higher um, a higher funding than something else. So I think it's in everybody's best interest, but it is a tool. And if people hate it, always here for feedback. And um, expect to post uh, in the forum next week on Karma. Uh, and this is just what it looks like. It's basically, uh, hey, who's got an open quick grant or um, RFP and posting updates on how you're you're delivering on your milestones. Cool. These are the active grants this month. Um, we had a couple closed down at the end of last month and then uh, one or two new ones open up this month. Uh, you can always see this list. It's in, uh, there's a, a public page in the notion that y'all can see. Um, and I will post this again in the forums for people to to review, but uh yeah these are the current ones open oh one other thing to call out here is i did make a new category recently which is the down maintainer category role it felt a little weird to be clumping in people who are maintaining tech with a quick grant or a socket um they're, they're very different use cases right it's not an experiment we know that this technology is being used and it needs to be maintained uh, and we're going to pay people to make sure that it has a certain quality of service and uptime so we've decided to create this maintainer role, which just has a different reporting. Essentially, um, someone like Shane would be overseeing and making sure that they're doing what they say they're gonna do every month and then approving that payment, as opposed to reporting back to the DAO, like how you're creating impact each month. It just, it doesn't, it's not apples to apples here. So if anybody has feedback on that, you can let us know as well. Cool. Shane, I'm gonna pass it over to you for some product updates. Cool. So uh, uh, we uh, regarding Morse, we have 86% uh, uh, validators have upgraded uh, to RC 011.1. Uh, this means that we can now do the actually initialize the upgrade. Uh, so we have it set for Monday, February 19th. If you're a validator, uh, be sure to be on comms then. Uh, Oshansky has uh, put up an announcement recently. Uh, and more information is going to be coming about uh, when exactly uh, they're going to flip the switch and what folks, uh, you know, uh, what folks can do. So be expecting some more info on that. Um, but this is the final Morse update uh, before Shannon. So it's a pretty, pretty cool milestone uh, to do this one last upgrade. And then we'll be on a completely new blockchain uh, with the with the next upgrade um you know fingers crossed if all goes so uh and also morse news uh liquify has announced the launch of their gateway uh it's not public facing yet uh but it's expected to be available in the near future uh, you might have seen some comms on twitter uh about it but this is uh exciting as this is i believe the third uh the third gateway um outside of grove and Nodis that's uh in the process of fully onboarding and yeah, we're excited to see them be a part of the ecosystem even more than what they already are as a node runner. Regarding Shannon, uh, we're on iteration 11, uh, which continues. Um, you can still track the team's progress on GitHub. 
Uh, basically, the, the main focus right now is just upgrading the Cosmos SDK from uh, version 0 0.45 to uh, 0 0.50. And that's a big migration. There's a lot of changes on dependencies and how the, modu uh, the modules work. And so uh, it's really taking a full team effort at this point. Um, so the team is kind of swarming that issue and focusing heavily on it. Uh, also in Shannon News, Thesis Defense has started their audit of uh, the SMP, uh, SNT. And so what this is, is this is the uh, sparse uh, Merkle tree, which basically is what is going to allow suppliers to say, hey, I did this much work uh, and uh, I need to you know, get paid for this much. And so it, without having all that data, be on chain in a very burdensome way because ultimately pocket is going to be serving you know trillions of uh relays a day and you can't have uh you know you can't have all this chain bloat for every single relay that goes through the system so this is going to be a really cool uh so it's a really cool novel way of cracking all this work and thesis defense is uh starting their thesis on this so Pretty exciting, pretty exciting stuff, but that's everything on the protocol side. Great, thanks Shane, really appreciate that update. Um, if people have questions, should they just DM you as or chat, um, especially for Monday's uh, announcements? Yeah, uh, yeah, folks can always DM or, or you know, uh, post in the chats uh, for sure. Um, I, I'm pretty sure more uh, there's going to be some more information on uh, uh, the exact timing of the Monday upgrade. So just be aware of the uh, of the announcements uh, when we give the exact time. Awesome. Cool. Thanks so much, Shane. If anybody does have any questions, you can definitely feel free to put them in the chat here. Um, and we have an open floor at the end. You can ask more. Okay. Ben, it's your big moment. <laughs> Time to shine. Yeah. Um, thanks, Zach. And yeah, thanks, everyone. I think this call got moved to, uh, to accommodate uh, me getting on. So um, much appreciated for that. Um, yeah, CREDS is the project name we gave to this governance upgrade that we're doing. Uh, CREDS, short for credentials, which... Um, you know, is really uh, really the key thing that we're trying to integrate here in the past. Um, uh, we had our trophy system, which um, sort of represented a, a number of activities. Um, we're now using verified credentials, which you can take outside of the pocket ecosystem wherever you go to other projects or further in your career, which is why we thought that was a, a good name for the project to start with. Um, but I think it's worth going back a little bit, Zach, maybe if we go to the next slide, just to... Um, just to sort of like remind people why we are doing this. Um, so um, I will say up front that the reason I joined Pocket was because of the governance system that they have. I think what Jack created is um, is absolutely wonderful um, uh, and uh, really makes a big difference compared to sort of the experiences I've had in other ecosystems where um, they've sort of had strict token voting um, or even delegated token voting, which often just masks um, the activity of whales. So um, we have a really good system and we, we um, are very serious about taking care not to uh, not to mess with that system too much um, so that we can keep the really good things about it and, and update the things that weren't working. So things that weren't working, actually, there are a number of gaps in representation. Um, our investors really had no path to a vote. Our nons are excluded because of um, sort of our selfie system for, for verifying employees of Grove, uh, employees uh, or contractors of PNF, um, and all of our new grantees pretty much excluded in their previous system because of the way that it's been structured. So um, it is critical that we uh, that we overcome that barrier and um, enfranchise as many people that really care about our ecosystem as possible. The other thing is just because of the way it's sort of designed, um, it's it's really slowed down. Like we've only had five new voters in the last 12 months, whilst at the same time we've probably had more talent coming into and contributing to our ecosystem than ever before. That just feels a bit off. Um, the other thing that's really, I guess, strange quirk of the system is, you know, previously using 
I guess, a soul-bound token or NFT means that people are keeping their voting power even after they've left. We have 60 voters. I think on our best day, we get 30 voters, which which is great representation of, of the total voting cohort. I don't think those other 30 are coming back. I think they've switched off. I think they're gone. Um, we shouldn't still be giving them power um, in our ecosystem or... If we are, we should be reducing that, um, given that they're not actively contributing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, the others are, are, you know, probably following on that theme of being a little bit more historical. Jack, are you on the call? And do you want to maybe just talk about, like, the imbalances and the manual process, sort of where that came from and how that feels? Yeah, I am. Uh, happy to do that. Um, so, yeah, um, when we first designed um, the trophy categories that we have, um, or the, uh, which can be considered different paths to onboarding into a vote, um, this was this was uh, basically sort of prior to mainnet launch, um, in a very different environment that we were in. We had very few apps, um, uh, customers all of pocket. We had a single gateway, um, which remained the case for a couple of years. Uh, we had just one core team of builders, um, and our top priority at the time was bootstrapping our supply side, which was still um, quite a young um, side of the market. Uh, so in hindsight, all of these starting conditions have ultimately influenced uh, how we constructed the voter paths. Uh, ben alluded to this when he talked about the gaps in representation that, that still exist today, but um, we only have a couple of votes that represent the demand side perspective. Um, we have three voters who have the, high, the, the higher level of um, being an ap application developer. Uh, these are actually independent developers. Um, uh, two of them are uh, Chris OG and Harry, um, who both have achieved those uh, as sort of independent uh, developers hacking away. Um, and one is uh, a member of the community that was um, building applications and, and using RPC. So um, we actually don't have really any representation from um, active customers of gateways uh, in pocket um, or or the gateways themselves. Um, so that's not that's not that's not ideal. Um, we're very uh, supply side heavy as far as governance, uh, supply side and builder. Um, uh, are the two are the two main categories represented in governance? Which um, obviously both uh, both of those categories are very knowledgeable about pocket and and can make informed decisions. But uh, we do we do need to balance that representation more as we mature as an ecosystem and and grant more power to uh, the demand side. Um, we also have onboarded a lot more contributors to. Uh, the ecosystem in the last year. Um, we've got a lot more grantees than we've ever had. Um, we built these uh, systems in place to streamline onboarding into being a contributor. Um, so this has been great to see, but none of these people are represented. Um, and if you look at the types of trophies that we have to represent contributions to Pocket, uh, they're, they lean on uh, community facilitation, like organize a community call or collect feedback or um, basically incentivizing people to be an extension of the core team in trying to facilitate our community, which is all very valuable. Um, we also have a few contribution areas around node tooling and app tooling um, and governance broadly. Uh, these are uh, represented each to a degree. Um, but these are very precise niches, and as a result, we have uh, people like Pocket News, who has done a lot of work in the last couple of years on um, general uh, communications and social media and so on, and we have a lot of grantees working on things that don't strictly fall under, into the category of no tooling uh, or community facilitation, etc. Uh, these people are not uh, being represented in governance either. Um, so we, we're, we're seeing a lot of imbalances that we, I don't think we could have expected to predict these uh, perfectly at the time, um, but we have been slow to evolve these. Um, uh, and, and actually that's one of the things that we would hope to achieve with this upgrade is laying more modular, uh, adaptable foundations that will help us to uh, make sure that the system continues to be um, reflective of 
of the current environment um, and not get sort of um, uh, into the stasis that we've we've seen uh, our uh, old system uh, enter. Um, and yeah, as for manual process, um, that's something I have personal experience of. <laughs> um, we uh, we've been pioneers ultimately of a of a new governance model that uh, that I think I, I, there's been a lot of friction um, and there has been frustration. And there's been a few people. Uh, on this call uh, and in our community that have um, had frustration hitting their heads against the wall uh, trying to trying to get their vote in the DAO um, uh, whether it was trying to get verified on bright ID um, and then um, and then actually get me to uh, to be more responsive in the trophies channel and uh, and so on um, there's been a lot of frustrations there because it is a manual process um, I think ultimately it's been a net positive uh, system that we've been using. We've we've ultimately been very capture resistant as a DAO. Uh, we've been very stable, um, and we've had a lot of engagement um, uh, from our most active community members. Um, so it, ultimately, uh, if you look at other DAOs with um, with m more established uh, tooling uh, on like token voting and so on. Um, I would say the pros outweigh the cons, but the cons still exist. Um, and ultimately, because we have been using this new model, um, the downside has been that the DAO tooling has not been there to meet our use case. Um, that has changed in the last year. Um, we yeah. One of the big catalysts for us to, to, to adopt this new upgrade is that there is no tooling available to us to be able to automate the system. So um, we no longer have to uh uh settle with a, a hacked together manual system that has um, bottlenecks in the process so yeah uh, it's an exciting yeah. time awesome thanks jack i think that's great uh, great context so um zach if you could go to the next slide um i think it's important yeah just just to sort of um, set out the principles that we're building upon um and i think regardless of what system uh, we end up with or go through, um, these are really critical things that I think define the, the system that um, the pocket has and, and will always aspire to have, which is that governance power sort of must be earned. It cannot be earned. Um, this proof of participation, as Masari called it, I think is a foundational model that we want to continue with um, uh, and take the best parts of that um, and continue to sort of be pioneers in driving them forward. Um, uh, and power within the DAO that is earned um, comes by creating impact. Um, that power grows with your impact. Um, today, the trophy system is sort of a bunch of, um, I guess, side quests. Um, but many of us are waking up every day sort of thinking about how do we uh, make a big impact on pocket, and that's the stuff that we want to be rewarding. Um, we don't want to have the opportunity cost of sort of earning governance power go against, you know, what's the most important thing, which is driving um, driving the project forward. So looking to harmonise or align those two things, which I think is really important. And then, yeah, the new system, I guess, um, has, you know, some interesting elements to it. Um, the most important thing for us, though, is that it, it just feels light and easy on the user to participate um, so that when you do work, um, uh, that that work is recognised um, and translates into governance power that you can uh, you can take forward without you know a whole bunch of calculations that you're constantly doing around um, what do I have to do to to sort of earn my vote. Um, so that's the basis for what we're doing. Um, uh, Zach, maybe the next slide we'll talk a little bit more about yeah how we are, how we plan to implement that. Um, so the three components that I think are probably most interesting to to end users when they're thinking about voting is um, getting a Gitcoin passport, um, which you just set up once, and basically uh, uh, verifies your identity, um, makes sure that you're a human without sort of exposing um, necessarily who that human is, um, is a really foundational thing that um, allows anybody to participate in our DAO, including um, really great contributors like Pocket News. Um, beside that, we have um, this set up in My Gateway, um, which is a, a, a verified credentials protocol. It's basically the backbone of our new system. 
Um, and through that, we can design and allocate credentials to people for many different things. All you need to do is attach your wallet and they will automatically sort of accrue in there. Um, and then there is one other tool that we're working with, which is Wonderverse, um, which sort of enables a lot of the front end around how you do this um, to become like a citizen or a member of the DAO. Um, you will still continue to sort of go on quests like you had in the past, um, but to claim credentials where you need to do that, um, yeah, Wonderverse is going to be something that connects into that gateway protocol and, and makes it easy for you as a sort of end user or participant to, um, to activate the whole system. Zach, maybe we'll go to the next one. Um, so quick walkthrough. Yeah, um, in Gitcoin Passport, you just connect your wallet um, and then you connect all of the other sort of uh, credentials that you have to prove that you're a unique person, whether that's your Coinbase account, whether that's your GitHub, um, your Gmail, your Facebook, whatever it happens to be. Essentially, connect to a whole bunch of things through proofs. Um, they don't actually record any of your details around this is your Gmail address or this is your Facebook login. Essentially, what they do is they verify that you're the holder of that account through you logging in. Yep. And then basically create a, a hashed proof, which um, which you can always call upon, but but doesn't expose any of your uh, any of your private data. And once you do that, you work your way up to a score. Um, the score that we've set is 15 for people to prove that they're a real person. Um, for some people, it, it can be, I think, slightly more challenging to get to that number. Um, you do need to connect a few different identifiers. But just as a simple example there, my own score is 42. So it's um, it's not particularly high bar to be setting for people to achieve that. Um, we think that's quite reasonable. Next one, Zach, is around gateway. Basically, as I said, this is the backbone of our system. You just connect your wallet, both your ETH wallet and your pocket wallet, and everything will accrue to those. If you're a staker, yeah, anything that you're doing with your pocket wallet, the credentials around that will um, accrue to your uh, to your gateway username, as will sort of things that you're doing with your ETH wallet. Um, if you're a liquidity provider into one of our pools, everything just gets attached back to this, which is great. It, um, it makes things really simple for you and really makes things simple for us because when it comes time to vote, all of your different power can be aggregated um, and you don't need to do anything. It is also a place where you can go in and see what credentials that you have. Um, so we'll step people through how they can, um, they can see that over time. Next one, Zach, is... Yeah, the, the quests or using Wonderverse, essentially um, all you need to do is go into Discord, yep, say what you want to do yep, uh, by going to the right channel, opening up the quest, completing the, the tasks which are all automated. Um, if we wanted to apply this to like the old trophy system, essentially you just go in, you, um, you attach everything and then it spits out at the end, hey, can Zach or, or Jack or whoever approve this? Um, and then it's all done. Um, once they click it's done, again, attaches back to that gateway ID so that your governance power is all aggregated. Um, this just provides a simple automated way for you to be participating. Um, and then the last one should be familiar um, to our existing DAO voters, maybe not familiar to all the people we hope to enfranchise, but um, uh, getting closer to being able to do that, which is exciting. Um, you just vote. Same as you've done in the past in Snapshot, um, all of your power will be aggregated in. Um, we've automated the system so that you don't need to do anything other than attach your main wallet, uh, the wallet that's attached to your gateway ID um, and your Gitcoin passport. And then you can vote with your full voting power directly in there. Um, so hopefully that's like a helpful walkthrough. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to have like an office hours. We're going to focus on onboarding because whatever the final sort of design of the system is, um, uh, the tools and technologies that enable it to happen will be the same. So we can uh, we can really start onboarding people without um, uh, prejudging what the outcome of the proposal or the final design looks like. Um, this will take over um, whatever system we uh, we end up with, um, which means that people can just get started with the, with that today. Zach, quickly to the next one, because I'm really keen for us to leave time. Um, yeah, I think people understand that we've sort of designed this multi 
house or multi-dimensional system. Um, the way that it's set up is to sort of balance power um, or representation across three groups in the community. Um, citizens who we define as, as basically members of our community, they believe in our DNA, they believe in our mission, and they understand how our organisation works. They will continue to operate with a one person, one vote mechanism, same as we've had before. For builders, um, uh, I think we could call this builder house, but we often refer to it internally as impact house. It's basically just impact weighted. So as your impact grows, as you build your capability or your impact in the ecosystem, um, you can work your um, governance power up. That, that is capped. You're basically just working back up to having one full vote. Yeah, it's not like someone's going to have 100x the power of someone else. It might be five or it might be 10. Um, but essentially what we're doing there is just creating a way for people to get onboarded and started into governance earlier than having to sort of spend three or six months here to, uh, to earn their vote. And then the last one is stakers. We, um, we have a token-weighted approach to their representation. There are some uh, actions we're taking to operate that differently. But essentially, um, all of those three mechanisms come together when you, when you go to vote. Um, yeah, next one. Cool. So here's just a representation of impact. Yeah. Essentially, what we're trying to do is create the ability for people to get onboarded and their impact to start getting represented in governance. These are just examples of what we call like an MVP. Yeah. The first initial enfranchisement of all of these different people into our governance system. Over time, we expect this to uh, to grow significantly. Each of those could be thought, if we think about the previous system, as as one trophy, yeah, with different points. And essentially, once you have ten points, you're a full voter in our DAO. So um, these are examples. I'd expect this list to continue to grow and evolve over time. And that's really the design of the system is to allow us to continue to add different measures of impact over time without having to create new quests, without having to create new personas, um, by just representing what is actually impactful in our community in governance, without trying to define the person or the user or the persona that's allowed to be um, able to vote. And then the next one, Zach, is, yeah, just talking about the Staker House. Um, I think a lot of people, myself included, um, have an immediate sort of adverse reaction to um, uh, token voting. Um, the principle that I think is really important to think about is that we specifically say our vision is to have a system that is owned and governed by its users. Stakers and users of Pocket really are like key users within our ecosystem um, and therefore I think they do need to be represented in governance. Um, it's why I guess all of the other DAOs out there do actually represent them um, and that's not a reason itself uh, <laughs> to be in franchising stake. Um, but when we think about our vision, um, there is a long-term need for POCT um, to actually be represented in governance somehow. And we're looking to take our first uh, very tentative steps into that space with some guardrails around that. Um, you cannot get governance power without being a citizen, sharing our values. Okay, sorry about that, mission. go ahead. Nope. Not sure if that's about me. Um, yeah, you, you, you can't just get governance power as a, as a token holder. Yeah, you have to be a, a real stakeholder in the ecosystem. Um, uh, and then we flatten the curve. Essentially today in most governance systems, whales control things. Um, we use a square root function on stake, which means that even if you're a very large holder, you do, do still carry significant and reasonable power in the ecosystem but never in a controlling way. Um, we will always have the ability for many different stakers to uh, to have impact within them, within the governance system itself. Cool, and here is just like a simple representation, maybe not simple. <laughs> 
<laughs> Got to be honest, um, it can be a, can be a little bit challenging to grok this at the start. But I, I just wanted to like illustrate with uh, with three personas here today. We have like about thirty voters. We we can like delude ourselves and say we have sixty. We we really only have thirty voters that are paying attention to us. Yep. So each vote is worth about three point three percent of the total voting power. Yep. Modeling out what the future state would look like with the model as it's designed today. If you're a really strong voter, like you are a you are a builder in our ecosystem, you have significant stake of a million pots and you have like significant capital of like 50k to put into our liquidity pools, your voting power would roughly come out the same in future. Yeah. If you think of an average voter, yep, um, because we are going to be enfranchising a number of new people, yep, maybe getting started in the ecosystem with staking, yep, maybe using a little of your uh, funny money to um, invest in our liquidity pools, yep, and, and just getting started, maybe doing some grants or, or earning some impact, yep. Um, the governance power is about like 1.56% of the total, yep. We're assuming, of course, different numbers and there's many variables that go into that, which I think is um, one of the challenges of, of first grokking this and why we're building a model to, uh, to allow people to play around and, and understand this a little bit more themselves. Um, but essentially, yeah, um, that gives you a rough representation of, of sort of what things look like individually as we go forward. Um, but of course... It's not always individual, <laughs> is it? Um, I think often we find that people vote in blocks. Um, so we've modelled out some scenarios which I think people will be uh, will be quite interested to see, which is a little bit more like what it looks like if you think about collective um, or potentially colluded voting power um, and what that might look like. If we take an entity like Grove, yeah, obviously a significant staker, uh, as a gateway, yeah, individually within the team, um, probably active in the liquidity pool, yeah, and many different builders, whether that's from, uh, you know, historical members like Ard or Mike who um, who already cover carry, carry governance power plus people from the protocol team would be looking to enfranchise. And then obviously a number of citizens, they have 30 employees who we hope would all consider themselves as part of the citizenship of pocket and, and want to participate in governance, yep. Their total power yep, as the strongest and I guess most diverse entity across the system is about 20% of the total system today. And of course, if we look at where that comes from, from gateways uh, and from building predominantly, um, you would expect that to go down over time as we have more gateways and many more people coming into our ecosystem and building. Another concern um, and a reason why I just wanted to represent this is, is on the CODA side, who is, a, is a, um, in control of a very large amount of custodial stake. Yeah. Um, when we apply that square root function, I think you can see that even though they have, what is it, um, 10 times the potential stake of someone like Grove, yeah, their voting power that accrues to that is only three times as much as Grove. So still consequential, they're still a meaningful and big part of our ecosystem, um, but don't have outsized weight. And if we think about Coda today, maybe having three voters in the DAO, um, they actually have less governance power probably than they did in the past, um, for better or worse. Um, so I hope that gives you an example. Like I said, we'll have a model that people can look at and think about um, what this looks like. But I did want to um, did want to sort of give that overview before we uh, before we get into some questions now. Um, and the good thing about it, Zach, is I will be stopping talking in the moment and opening the floor to people. But um, yeah, we we really want to sort of maybe give people an open floor. We've got a bunch of prompts here to ask different questions and explore different themes. Um, but given I've been going on for about, yeah, maybe 10 minutes, um, Zach, do you want to open the floor and just see if we've got some questions that people want answered? Floor is open. Drop any questions you have in the chat or uh, feel free to just unmute and ask them.
if we don't have any questions, Ben, maybe you can yeah. just take these as the prompts and talk through a few. Sure, sure. I, I might actually call on some people as well because um, uh, I think I saw Mike on the call before um, and he and I had a, a conversation yesterday about this specific slide basically, like are we solving the right problems? Yep. Um, and are we applying the right solutions to those problems? So, Mike, not sure if that's a good time for you to, to jump in and share what you might be thinking. Yeah, can you uh, can you guys hear me? Sure can. Awesome. Um, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, every, basically, I, I think my main my main concern with the current design is uh, uh, with the the idea of token. Or I'm sorry, with the with with the weighting of individual votes. I think we're solving for all of the right things. Uh, when I look at kind of the the challenges in the post that uh, Jack outlined, I think in September or October, uh, uh, we can solve for all of that for all of the amazing tooling and uh, updating of the system that uh, uh, that you guys have done. And I think my biggest uh, concern is with kind of two things. It's really this idea of, of cognitive overhead. Uh, of understanding the system. Uh, every single participant in this ecosystem uh, is likely focused on building what they're building, uh, investing in what they're investing, um, and, and putting as little overhead, uh, cognitive overhead on understanding the system and understanding the votes, uh, I think will go a long way in just general participation. Uh, I also think that I, I worry about this idea of kind of uh, Regulatory capture uh, uh, in a, in a way where w when I think about power in a system like this, and and obviously I want Pocket to be a protocol that survives hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. And uh, uh, if I, for example, who who run runs Grove, uh, have an outsized impact alongside a couple other folks like Coder and these others, uh, I worry about kind of the overweighting of of of, of these entities when. That's the, 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 the coordination or the conversation or the political nature of this kind of a DAO uh, will naturally happen, right? We're gonna, you know, our, we, between our own uh, efforts with, with stakers and, and participation in the ecosystem, we are already creating relationships and we have many relationships across the ecosystem. And, and, and that kind of soft power is already there with those relationships. I worry by, by increasing kind of the weight across all the different functions that we contribute to, that we have a uh, uh, an ability for, you know, not Grove because you know I will always make decisions for the long term benefit of the protocol, but any other actor uh, to to be able to collude and and uh, uh, you know effectively be able to capture uh, or, or or push through votes that are good for them uh, rather than 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 for the ecosystem or even for for uh, their own self interest. So. Uh, that said, I do think that everything, quite literally everything else is sorely needed. I completely agree with uh, uh, making it easier for other folks to vote. I think every person in a company that's working around this ecosystem should be able to have a vote um, uh, and any other contributor through their natural process of participating within the ecosystem, however that might be. Uh, and I do think all these tools that uh, you outlined here, Ben, are sorely needed. Um, I generally think that participation within the active set of voters is uh, is just about right. Uh, it, it maps pretty nicely across what a normal democracy uh, uh, has, right? Somewhere usually between 30 and 70% is pretty average. And it looks like we're generally around the 50% range, but but sometimes more or sometimes less, depending on how contentious that vote is. Uh, so so really fundamentally, I just, I, I just think that uh, uh, one person, one vote is a simpler system uh, uh, and I worry about uh, uh, over complicating things when the same dynamics will uh, will continue to happen regardless uh, uh, in that respect um, so so those are kind of the main thoughts that I had especially particularly after that conversation we had uh, a couple of days ago Ben I'm curious on other people's thoughts honestly because these are kind of my my, my, my feelings on it uh, spent a lot of time thinking about this with Jack obviously uh, several years ago um, I think the system that we have has gotten us uh, a very long way, 
uh, and absolutely needs uh, to 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 needs to make it easier for for others to participate in the system. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, I'm I'm really um, keen to hear from other people as well, um, whether it's on the specifics or, or yeah, on the um, on the higher order thinking around what sort of system we want. Um, would be great if other people um, want to jump in and share. So regarding the weighting, uh, I think uh, I think if you go back one slide, you uh, it was showing the scenarios, yeah, with Grove encoder, and Grove here has you know around twenty percent. Um, what I I believe in the forum, I was confused, and I think it was clarified that. That 20% is not 20% of all voting power, but 20% of any vote that they like if 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 all 30 employees and everyone all vote simultaneously and at you know with the same vision, uh that will only account for 20% of that vote versus 20% of the full voting power. Because if, if voter turnout is only uh 50 percent right they have almost 50 percent of the uh uh of the you know vote was determined by them but i i believe it was mentioned that it's only 20 percent of the of that actual vote um not of all voter power so if lower if yeah. the voter it, uh representation is low it doesn't increase their power is that is that right i'm still not exactly sure how that works yeah yeah um always um voting power is a function of turnout or participation basically so um uh, it's right in that um yeah whatever power someone has is is um uh only represented by what the actual participation or turnout is on, on the day. Um, I think what I would call your attention to on this slide in particular is it's assuming that everyone in vote in Grove votes, yep, all vote the same way, yep, and then the participation is defined by what we sort of have up above there, yep, which is... Um, yeah, this group of 130 citizens, you know, 50 builders with combined sort of weight of, of 300 points and then, you know, 500 million pocket staked. So, um, yeah, that, that power could, of course, go up or down depending on what Grove's own turnout is, what the broader participation is. Um, but from a modelling perspective, I think the only reasonable way to do that is to um, is to expect that we, uh, we vote, um, we figure out what our broader participation looks like and, and what the whole sample is. Um, not sure if that covers what you're asking, Shane. I, I think the the broader point, maybe just thinking back to previous conversation, was was the clarity around yeah, Gro Grove has power as a gateway specifically because we are enfranchising the gateways themselves with a particular amount of power. But um, yeah, they can only have within that the you know um, the eight percent of total voting power that is going to gateways. So um, I think maybe that was more what you're alluding to. Is that right? Yeah, I just I, I'm not sure how voter turnout affects these percentages. That's that's what's not entirely clear. So yes, there are 130 you know citizens in the full voting block, uh, potential voting block uh, in this mm. scenario. But what if only 50 percent of them show up? Right? Mm. How? How then do these percentages change or affect uh, lower voter turnout? Because that's, you know, the nature of DAOs is you're going to have some proposals that have high significance uh, mm -hmm. and energy, which, you know, get a lot of votes, while there's going to be others that uh, folks, you know, just don't really have much say in and decide not to vote in at all. So they have lower turnout. So. Yeah. yeah, that's where I'm not sure how voter turnout will affect this. So I think that that would be kind of the next step of what I would want to see from this kind of modeling is is go to the next. Yeah, the next yeah. Uh, layer of that, which is voter turnout. 
Okay, that's that that's clear. Yeah. yeah. Did someone else um, trying to jump in? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say right, right. Oh, go for a microphone. Your thought, I, I was just gonna say I, I don't think this system is solving for for at least the, the, the weights specifically yeah. are solving for voter turnout. I think everything else is, right? So making it easier to get a vote, making it easier for people to be more involved and claim that vote. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, as people get deeper in the ecosystem, they create more connections with each individual, which ultimately incentivizes them to want to turn out because there's something that affects more than one person, right? Um, so fundamentally, mm -hmm. I think the one person, one vote um, as is, uh, uh, and, and the system, all the work that you guys are doing at the foundation to make it easier, whether through technology or, or, or segmenting through, through citizens and builders and stakers ultimately makes it easier for people to turn out. Um, uh, but through that process, naturally, as you get deeper in the ecosystem, you're going to make more connections, whether through events or through working together or, or, or however else. Right. So ultimately mm -hmm. I think that's what impacts voter turnout more than, more than anything. Um, and at the end of the day, I think human nature will be such that, you know, I will come out for the votes that I care about and I won't for, for those that I don't, for example. Yeah. And, and, and even to your, your question, Shane, um, yeah, what, what we want to do is we want to make sure that everyone's represented. Um, what I don't necessarily want to be doing is, um, yeah, making you having to think about, <laughs> you know, what's grow versus what's coda versus, you know, what does all of this look like? That, um, that That's not the real intent behind this. It is to get, um, to Mike's point, more people participating so that um, everyone feels enfranchised and represented without um, without this being open to capture. So your question itself, yeah, leads, um, leads us to be able to share some other things around, um, yeah, how we can make uh, understanding this a bit easier, but also, um, yeah, how we can make it a little bit simpler for uh, for people to just pick up. Um, cool. I, I might ask Zach. We can just go to the next slide. I'm not sure if, um, uh, yeah, if if anyone else wants to sort of jump in on this question of waiting, um, yeah, it seems to be one of the key uh, key questions around like. Um, yeah, the system as it is today being very simple with with really no waiting other than one person, one vote. Um, yeah, is there any other comments or questions that people want to ask at this point around waiting? I, I think the main question do I, ha I have around waiting is is whether this actually scales um, the one person, one vote, because I, I don't think that the current system is scalable. Uh, once we have 300 individuals uh, uh, participating, right? Um, uh -huh. Wait, it's already pretty uh, convoluted with, with the 30 voters we have today. I worry about what that looks like uh, 10X this. Um, you know, traditionally in democracy, that's been, that's been, that's been um, uh, solved through things like delegation and, and, and other mechanisms. And uh, I do think that there are some versions of this that can help scale uh, uh, voting uh, in terms of waiting and this sort of thing. I don't know what that looks like, but um, that's the other thought that I have is that like, you know, uh, does this help scale in a world where we have 300 active voters right um i don't i don't know the answer to that question um yeah uh, but but just generally um you know I, I i'd rather solve for the more fundamental problems and then and then um uh, uh you know not put the cart before the horse in, in that respect yeah but one one thing just to sort of share um something i've been reflecting on i think um i think it's an important question for um uh, for people like yourself, Mike, but, but just more broadly advocates of the one person, one vote system, the, the inherent challenge with it today and, and going forward is is at what point do you get a vote? Like it is very binary. You either have full voting power or no voting power. So so the question at large is like do we want to enfranchise a bunch of people um, that probably have, you know, maybe less knowledge, less stake um, uh, so that they have the ability to participate? Yeah. Um, or do we want to sort of go more granular? It, it does feel like a inherent trade off of the system. And, and of course, we, whatever system we come up with, we need to continue to tune that. But, um, but one trade off that, that people need to think about if we, uh, if we continue with um, a less granular system is, is how we actually lower that barrier to earning a vote. Because today, a, a real challenge is the fact that, um, yeah, you have full voting power or none, which I think is the thing that's stopping us from enfranchising so many more people. Yeah, if I could well, just I, uh, if I could just build no. on that, 
um, I think a good a good illustration of this is basically one of the things that we tried to solve for was the threshold to get to a vote was was quite high, um, which meant that it took some time for people to actually get on board. So we're looking to lower that threshold, and uh, with the citizens' house, it's the lowest uh, threshold that we have. They just have to answer a couple of questions about pocket to prove that they uh, have engaged a little bit with some of our core materials and so on. Um, but that doesn't mean that they understand uh, the intricacies of pocket and the different factors that go into a decision. If we were to take this system, if we were to lower the threshold to a vote and then also maintain one person, one vote for everyone, uh, we're essentially uh, departing from the proof of participation, proof of knowledge philosophy that we've held to date. And we're saying that anyone who is a minimum uh, viable community member uh, gets an equal vote in the DAO. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. That is like we can uh, we can't simultaneously make it easier for people to onboard into the DAO and also uh, maintain one person, one vote. So by having these weightings in place, um, we enable us to lower that onboarding uh, first step uh, without, while still maintaining some level of, you have to build up your knowledge, you have to prove your participation, and in doing so, you earn more of a vote. Yeah, I guess, I guess practically though, you know, if I'm one individual, one vote, and I gain, I, I become a citizen, fantastic. Functionally or practically, I, I don't have much power or influence, right? Whereas an organization like Grove or Coder or Pocket Scan or, or, or Pocket Pool or anyone else that has uh, meaningful weight through either uh, individual ecosystem connections or their just own organization will just naturally have more power. I think it's a fine line uh, in terms of like how easy it is uh, to become a citizen, but I don't think, you know, in, in practice, uh, that one individual is going to have more power than 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 an org or someone who's more influential within the community. I think it takes real work and frankly proof of participation in in in, in being active within the community to actually gain that power. Um, obviously, you know, we don't want uh, you know to be sibled and 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 this sort of thing, but fundamentally, like, you know, it still takes time and effort to kind of gain that that influence. And at the end of the day, like this system isn't uh, uh, a change or a departure from that at the end of the day, in, in, in my opinion. So like, you know, we can, we can lower the barrier. I think having some sort of, uh, de uh, uh, degradation of your power over time is critical. Like, like Ben alluded to having, you know, 60, you know, technical voters, but really 30 or so active ones, uh, finding a way for those folks to, to kind of lose their power over time, I think is important. Um, otherwise, you know, we're, we're open to being simple attacked as a, as, as a DAO, right? Uh, because some um, external force can, you know, garner a citizenship and then and then vote, right? Um, so so I, I'm not so sure that that uh, you know it's kind of like uh, 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 you know the masses and and you know and versus the elite in this respect, um, uh, where where kind of the elite in this respect is are the people who are actively building companies. Uh, but if one you know individual who's you know honestly coming in and wanting to participate can get, Claim a vote and and start to interact with other organizations. I think that's that's you know it, it, to your point, Jack. I, I I don't think that that necessarily changes uh, uh, kind of the 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 functional power within the ecosystem. In my opinion, just one one comment, and it's not an in, in intention to strawman uh, your argument or anything, but um, I don't think that I think if we're relying on uh, what you described there of like organizations having influence and um, essentially politics. I, I, <laughs> I don't know if I, I want to be in a, a system that, 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 that re rests on that as being uh, the, the lifeblood uh, of governance. Um, it sounds, yeah, it sounds not ideal. It sounds vulnerable to, to capture. Um, uh, ultimately it becomes uh, the people that have that play that political game the best um, are the ones that that come out on top. Uh, where we've always strived to have a meritocratic system um, uh, rather than one that is uh, too political.
obviously there's always going to be polit- politics, but yeah, I don't know. I just, uh, I got a little bit uh, triggered uh, by this idea that if we, if we have one person, one vote, it's okay because uh, people will still wield influence and it won't be um, just a, a, a thoughtless mob. I think that's inevitable. Yeah, I, I, I was about to say, I, I do think that that is, you know, Regardless. just part of... <laughs> part of being human, I think. Right. Uh, yeah, I'm not saying it's not inevitable. I'm just saying <clears throat> if you have such a simple system uh, that without any guardrails in place that you're relying solely on that, um, it doesn't sound super healthy. Well, well, I think that also goes to the idea of governance minimization and reducing the the, the surface area by which people can be political on um, at the end of the day. But 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 yeah, I, I think it's if humans are behind something, it's 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 just uh, part of the human condition at the end of the day. And and I think that goes to the ideas of, of legitimacy and the process by which people and and what people vote on is what reduces kind of that. Uh, uh, political nature of things. I think by having the fact that uh, you are a citizen um, proves some level of, of knowledge and contribution is important. Um, and having that level of you know degradation of votes over time helps ensure that it is meritocratic in the sense that people that are building uh, and continue to build will have um, that, that power, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I I find all these uh, all these points super interesting. Uh, personally, I really enjoy this kind of conversation and thinking through uh, the the weighting as it's being presented uh, provides um, hard weighting uh, in terms of you know mathematical weighting, and then the uh, and then Michael is presenting you know the soft weighting that is accompanied mm-hmm. with any human system. Uh, and so, you know, it, it sounds like if I'm to steel man his argument, it sounds like he's saying uh, because the soft weighting already exists and you're already going to have this, uh, you know, people's vote or influence already have more weight in general because of their place in the ecosystem. Once you add more uh, mathematical weight to that, um it's it's easier to capture uh, a larger uh you know a larger chunk of the pie because they have the soft weight and they have the uh uh the hard weight so uh so that that seems like that's what his concern is and when i'm thinking of kind of both of those you know one area that all this is new territory or th- uh, even this is a new structure for a lot of DAOs. DAOs don't really have this. So we are kind of entering into new territory. And I'm not necessarily opposed to that personally. I I, I find the hard weighting intriguing uh, because I feel like there have been times in the past where it would have been nice to have some hard weighting. Um, but then uh, but then I'm, I understand where Michael's coming from. I think would be interesting here with with whatever weighting we end up going with um i think it's important to potentially put time bombs on it where uh where citizens or certain votes have to be voted on on only on the citizen level without the weighting level um and have certain time bombs so if we wanted to try out uh what's on screen right now uh it's tried out and when it's uh voted on and with the constitutional changes it's structured in such a way where uh, unless, you know, maybe citizens, uh, a citizen vote or something like that uh, enables this same weighting in the future, uh, it will naturally die out or something like that. That would change things so that if it does snowball, like Michael's saying, uh, there's actually a, a, a reset that is, you know, built into the system that uh you know can't be um you know where where basically the electorate has to re-agree that yes this is a good system uh because i think it's when when waiting or something of that nature doesn't have a check on it uh on like hey temperature check is this good is this working um that's where you can get into these places where you have people that have just power that no one can really compete with so anyway, yeah. that's just kind of my thought on it. If we're going to take this experiment with the hard weighting, um, 
yeah, there there are still some safety features that I believe can be established inside uh, more of like the constitutional side that help protect it from some of the concerns of uh, you know that Michael was bringing up. Yeah, just just <clears throat> two things on that, Shane. Um, first, I, I I think like um, you're navigating this in in like a meaningful way, which is uh, which is thinking about you know what's um uh what's the best design to sort of take this forward i think um whatever we come up with um it's going to be some combination of um of different elements of what's been uh, what's been presented here um but you're also talking about yeah the the thing which is um most important to me and and i think the whole foundation team which is um uh to take this forward in whatever form it takes as an mvp um which ensures you know the safety of the DAO and and eliminates you know the concerns being expressed here about um, yeah collusion or capture or those sorts of things as as we sort of said at the start of the call um, nothing is more important to us than than that as stewards of the project to make sure that yeah we have a, a system which enfranchises all of the great people that are looking to get involved in Pocket um, without sort of opening the door to people who um, who Pocket's really done a good job of, of sort of keeping out so far and um, and hopefully can continue into the future. Um, Zach, if you just want to go forward a couple more slides, because I, I think it is actually worthwhile. Um, uh, uh, maybe skip that one, but but um, if you could just go back to the citizens one a again. I, I think I am really interested to hear from more community members how they feel about you know, having a new joiner come in and have the same power as themselves or as Michael, um, and just how you sort of uh, think and experience that. Um, you know, this is a co-design type process. So the more voices we can get in um, to that conversation, the better. If anyone else wants to add their thoughts on that. So what was interesting is when we ran a poll in the unofficial TG, the number one answer was people actually wanted one person, one vote. Um, that I think had about 35% of the total voting power. So you know, compare that. No, I do, do I agree with that? No, I don't. I think there should be a differential. Um, and I've been relatively vocal on that. And I'm obviously doing more work in, in my socket on this and what sort of is the optimal power distribution. Um, but it was interesting to see that we had a surprising amount of people. The number one um, uh, vote was, was for one person, one vote. And number two was for a 2x power. Um, we had options up to, I think, 50x, 100x. So that kind of, sort of throws them in some, some info from the community at large, as opposed to kind of us you know, right in the weeds, uh, what people are thinking about this. Awesome. Thank you. What, what was your answer? <laughs> Was it 2x or 3x? I, I was trying not to bias people. I, I think it is 20x okay. <laughs> uh, between Michael and someone new. Um, so I was surprised at how, how many people wanted a, a 1 for 1 or a 2x. Um, so it's, it's an interesting data point. We don't have to take it on. And, and yeah, we're, we're not slaves to, to, the, to the populace right now yet. But it was interesting to see how many people sort of thought that. Um, and maybe it was the question was, was, was questioned wrong. Um, but yeah, that was it. Was it was interesting data, and I was surprised to see it, and I and I would not have predicted that. Mm. And Mike, I know I know you just personally feel comfortable with this um, with this comparison at times, but um, I, I think it's good for the record just to um, just to articulate why yeah you um, you don't, you um, are such an advocate of one person one vote um, and someone new conceivably having the the same sort of voting power as yourself. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> any lead organizations is going to ultimately um, find great influence. Um, and, you know, I'm coming from a very uh, American perspective here. But you know, uh, <laughs> there's some of uh, this being captured uh, by, by, by overly, you know, in, in the U.S. case, uh, who, Monetary interest. And, you know, to look wrong and, and this sort of thing. And I'd more about 100 years from now or 50 years from now um, in terms of as this protocol starts to grow uh, 
frankly, the top protocols in the world. And eventually, things ossify. Um, uh, the same organizations that 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 that, that kind of succeed. Uh, 20, 30, 40 years later, and, and uh, I worry about uh, so that's kind of come, come, come hey, Michael, I don't know if you can hear us, but you're you're breaking up really bad, I don't think. We're not getting anything you're trying to transmit at this point. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Much better. Yeah, way better. Yeah. Cool. I'll uh, I'll just jump in because I think um I think we caught yeah m most of that um just missed a little bit towards the end there but but thinking over that long time horizon around um. Yeah, capture of the organization and then obviously the, the soft power that he can continue to exert and influence um, given his connection to so many people across the, the ecosystem, um, which I think is a is really helpful context. The, the last one that I sort of wanted to um, talk about and introduce, just open up to the floor, um, is this idea of enfranchising stake in some way. I think we've expressed... Um, uh, you know, the need to explore that um, uh, at some stage. Um, I think that's going to be part of the future of uh, what the system looks like um, in some form. But, um, yeah, just wondered if anyone wanted to talk about, um, yeah, how they feel about that, particularly philosophically, um, but also just uh, just having a look there at some of the raw numbers and seeing um, the safeguards put in place around what that looks like. I'd say I think we need some discussion on, I think, I think most people are in agreement, certainly I am, that uh, stakers or people who hold POC in some, some way or sort of um, you know, helpful capital do need representation. I think the question which has been raised a few times, and I certainly raise it, is how much representation? Are they really as impactful as all the builders put together? Uh, I would say no to that. Um, you guys can see my, my sort of longer thoughts in the forums. Uh, but I think that's sort of a question worth raising is, while we, I think we generally agree that stakers and impactful capital should have some voting power, is that as much as all the builders put together? Um, I think that's probably worth exploring in more detail. You're a robot again, thank, Michael. Thank you, broken up again, Mike. Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> no, no, really. In and out. Some, sometimes. Try now. Yeah. Yeah, it's gone again, unfortunately. Um, give Mike a moment, see if we can find another spot that might be a bit better. Anyone else want to jump in on this? I think it's a really important question. Is this better? Yes, better? it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I, just, I, won't, I won't move. Um, I, I'm generally really interested in the idea of the pocket token um, through governance capturing some met, uh, so, some level of, of measurable value. Um, my, my only uh, concerns are, you know, effectively all the builders and participants are in some form already stakers or at least willing to bet some, you know, 90 plus percent of them are. Um, so they're kind of, just as you know, everyone is already incentivized as uh, kind of a participant in pocket uh, to represent uh, stakers more generally, more broadly. Um, so, so that's kind of where, where I, you know, I, I don't have a strong opinion on, on, on stakers generally as currently designed. It's more along the lines of, you know, how can we have a measurable 
uh, uh, capture of value um, through uh, through kind of the pocket token is is really interesting um, to me and in very measured and and careful experiments, particularly uh, uh, just generally, because I think at the end of the day, you know, if you're willing to put money where your mouth is, uh, is is a really powerful statement. Uh, uh, and given the nature of, of, of our space, uh, you you know, I would rather embrace it rather than rather than rather than ignore that. You know, coming from a you know to what I spoke about earlier from an American uh, point of view and, and that kind of level of capture. So um, those are just kind of my general opinions on it. Cool. Well, I uh, I think uh, I think this has been a valuable uh, conversation. Um, yeah, to have on the record for for other people that might be um, catching up later and, and wanting to listen into this, um, and for ourselves as thinking about yeah, what um, you know, what's the best, safest, and most effective design of um, of the system that we bring up for the vote in the next couple of weeks. Um, Zach, maybe you could um, just step through to the page about what's next i think it'd be good to give very high level um sort of view of um what we think the next few weeks look like um so firstly um yeah we're going to spend a lot more time sort of taking people through the technology and onboarding side as has been expressed here regardless of um yeah what the final design looks like the the tech and the updating and the automation of this um of this system um will go forward regardless so we've got um big opportunity to uh Start getting people prepared for and onboarded uh, onboarded into that now. Um, we will continue our conversations with people, um, you know, online like this. Uh, happy to do more calls. I think we're going to do an office hours um, next week, um, uh, as well as directly if anyone wants to reach out and sort of discuss the design and get more uh, questions answered, um, share their own thoughts about how we uh, how we make this as effective as possible. Um, before uh, before we put up a final proposal and and hopefully get it up for a vote in the uh, in the coming weeks. Um, so that's the go forward from here. I think this has been an um, important milestone on the journey, though. So um, appreciate everyone for participating. Um, and apologies to you, Zach, for uh, for running us. I think twenty minutes over what the original time um, was. So. I'm going to pass back to you, Zach, to close us out. Great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and thanks, everybody who contributed to the conversation here. Um, as you said, this is going to go up online. Uh, thank you, Jerry, for, for all your hard work on that. So we can review it and other people can tune in who didn't make it today. Um, and maybe just like my final thought on this is, you know, like we're trying to make a system better than the one we have. And so um, I maybe not getting too caught up over is this the perfect system because it's going to be a better system that we can iterate on um, and we can use your help on how to make that happen. So um, yeah, like we're, we're probably going to get some things wrong and we can always modify these things. So um, I guess I'm trying to say like, let's make it better than it is now and we can fix things as we progress versus trying to get everything perfect at the start. And so I want to big thank you to Ben and uh, Jack for all of your hard work on getting this out. Really appreciate that happening. And I think being that we are a full 20 minutes over, unless anybody has a fire, um, I think we're just going to wrap this up. So yell if you got a fire. Otherwise, thank you, everybody. Really appreciate your time today. Um, appreciate being flexible on the timing as well. And like I said, we won't have another community call until after ETH Denver, so that'll be early March, but um, just check the, the events in Pocket Network Discord, and those will be up to date. Thanks, everybody. Nice one. Thanks a lot. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye.